I'm, I'm afraid, afraid I'm going to do a bit of bad form after such a good lunch when you're beginning to digest. I'm going to start with some bad news. Bad news for you in your capacity as leaders of uh, the search industry. Bad news for you as your clients in, in terms of the companies. Bad news actually for you as individuals as you think about your family, as you think about your family finances, as you think about your children's education. Um, I will come on to some good news afterwards, but I want to start with the bad news. And the bad news is the intuition that you have built up over the last 30, 50 years could get you to the wrong answer when it comes to making decisions. It could get your clients to the wrong answer. The world is fundamentally changing. We're seeing four disruptive forces hitting the world economy. Any of those disruptive forces are larger than anything we've ever seen and we're getting all four of them coming together, such that the intuition you have about how the world works may be wrong. So for those of you who are worried about your clients, those of you worried about your business, those of you worried about your family, or for those of you who are worried about health, anyone who, for instance, thinks they may need to have a heart transplant at some point, you know, your intuition on all of that could well be wrong, I'm going to talk about how to reset it. Now, this is not a new phenomenon, having intuition about how the world works, giving you the wrong answer. Um, this is the quiz part of it. Does anyone um, know who said this? Heavier than air flying machines are impossible. Very well known scientist. British scientist, okay. This one is less well known, maybe. That was our Lord Kelvin, the person whose temperature gauge we still use. His intuition about what could happen in terms of flying machines was wrong, because he had built up his intuition over his life. He had never seen something that could fly. As a result, he said, you know, it's impossible. Um, it's not, though, just scientists that have intuition giving them the wrong answer. World market for maybe five computers. Any? Someone quite close to here, actually. That was... Um, Thomas Watson. Luckily, his colleagues at IBM uh, ignored his view on that and manufactured more than five. Um, how about the arts world? Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? <laughs> it's not Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin is the most common answer on this one, actually. It's Harry Warner, Warner Brothers. Luckily, his studio also ignored his advice. Um, so, you know, the artistic community relied on their intuition, too, about what customers wanted, but got that wrong. Um, there will not be a woman prime minister in my lifetime. That was a Churchill, actually, it was even better. It was Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> this one is someone whose intuition about how the world worked, and she, the rest of her quote is the male population is due prejudice. The rest, her intuition about what was going to be necessary to be a prime minister. She, she not only had the intuition wrong, she was the one who disproved her intuition being wrong. Um, so, you know, the political community that relied on intuition got the world wrong. And then um, the cell phone market in the US will be 900,000 by the year 2000. Out by a factor of 100. Absolutely, that was us. <laughs> so, Lots of people relied on their intuition, and their intuition got them to the wrong answer, and they made potentially the wrong decisions on the basis of it. And the world we're about to go into is going to be even more turbulent, so relying on your intuition will get you to the wrong answer even more so than it has in those cases. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why the world's going to be different. I'm going to give you some examples, and then I'm going to come back and say, well, what does this mean for the attributes of leadership we need going forward. So we think about leaders in this new world as we think about the types of people that you're placing, what are the attributes that are going to become more important going forward? But let's just remind ourselves about the world we lived in. The world we've lived in has actually been an incredibly benign period. We've had phenomenal demographics driving productivity. We've had reduced macro volatility. We've had resources that have been cheaper. Capital's got cheaper. Labor has been abundant. We've had governments being able to cut taxes, promise more, uh, etc. And we've had a world where most people have grown up richer than their parents. 
this has been a phenomenally good world. To put this in context, if we look at the last 2,000 years economic growth, basically for 1,700 years, the world had a good growth year when it grew at 0.3% a year. That was the level of growth we had, and it was largely driven by demographics. You see the dark bit is about population growth. So we basically had 1,700 years of almost no growth in terms of the global economy, as we would say today, you know, 0.3 is almost no growth. And then the Industrial Revolution happened, and we started to see growth powering up, both through growing population, but more importantly, productivity was improving. As we urbanized the world, first of all in the UK, then in Europe, and then the US, we were able to increase GDP per capita much, much faster. And since the Second World War, it's been even better. We have lived through a period where growth rates have averaged between 3 and 5%. Implicit in the way we think about the world is the world has grown at that level. That has not been true for the last 2,000 years, but it has been true for the last 60 years. And in many cases, as we think about assumptions about business, about how the world's going to change, there is that implicit assumption about growth. And that's underpinning our intuition. In addition, we've had falling interest rates. This chart shows interest rates, the top of the black one in nominal terms, the bottom in real, over the, since 1980. Interest rates have fallen from 8% to 14% down to basically zero in real terms, underpinning a lot of asset price appreciation. One of the reasons house prices in a lot of parts of the world have gone up is interest rates have fallen. It's also population other factors too, but that's actually underpinned asset price appreciation. And much of the asset price appreciation we assume is normal was underpinned by this and the economic growth we talked about, not necessarily uh, a sustainable source going forward. And we've had resources become cheaper, despite the 20-fold increase in world GDP over the last century. Resources, and this is a basket, materials, food, energy, water actually declined in value. So we've got resources cheaper. So that's provided a massive tailwind to the world economy. Now we're seeing this being disrupted. Four forces are disrupting it. None of these forces are particularly new to you, but what is, I think, most of us struggle with is getting our head around the scale of these and the second and third order effects of these forces. The first one is around industrialization. We've got technology aging, and then finally we connected the world up in a way that we're not very used to. So we get these four forces coming together. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these forces and what they, they mean, and then I'll come back and sort of pull them all together and say, here's some examples of what this means when we think about different areas. The first one, the urbanization and industrialization. The population of cities around the world is increasing by 65 million people every year. Some of that is migration, and some of that is actually about higher population growth in cities. To put that in context, that is seven Chicago's a year, every year. That's the growth rate of cities. Now, this is not a new phenomenon. We have seen urbanization over time driving GDP growth. See these charts showing different countries, how urbanization and GDP per capita go up together. And we can see India and China just on exactly the same trajectory as the United States, Japan, Korea, uh, UK have been on in the past. The difference is the speed and scale that this is happening. So we go back and look at the British Industrial Revolution, first big industrial revolution. It took us about 150 years in the UK to double GDP per capita. Despite everything everyone talks about the British Industrial Revolution and the fact that it underpinned a British empire, and the fact that it underpinned big changes in British society, actually it was relatively slow. 150 years to double GDP per capita, and it was relatively small, less than 10 million people at the start. Subsequent industrial revolutions happened a bit faster, and you can see that you know, South Korea ended up doing it in about 10 years. The big difference between India and China, though, is they're doing it at a different scale. Now, put these numbers into context, India and China are going about 10 times as fast as the British Industrial Revolution. And when we put them and other emerging markets together, 300 times the scale. 10 times as fast, 
300 times the scale. You multiply the two together, you'd be a bit loose on the maths, you get a force that is 3,000 times the size of the British Industrial Revolution. And that is happening now in emerging markets. That is shifting the center of gravity of the world in a way that, again, many of us are not very used to. One of the ways of looking at this is actually to work out where the global economic center of gravity of the world is. And if you do the calculation, in the year one, it was really on the India-China border. Because India and China together were about 35% of global GDP in the year one. Japan, the rest of Asia. And you can see what happens to the center of gravity as the Industrial Revolution happens, moves over to Europe, then uh, after the Second World War it starts recovering, and at the moment it's in North Russia, and by 2050 it will be back pretty close to where it started. Now think about where your economic center of gravity is. Mine is very much 1950 world. I'm still, despite having lived in Asia for six years, I'm still very much North America, Europe axis in terms of the way I think about things. That is becoming less relevant. The economic center of gravity is moving. And by 2050, or 2025 on this chart, 2050 it's gonna be in Kazakhstan roughly as it moves towards Central Asia and then Africa kicks in and it starts coming down. So that's our first thing is our mental model about where the world matters is shifting. The second disruption is technology. Now this again is not a new disruption. The printing press disrupted the monks that used to write out Bibles by hand. Now those monks lost their jobs or had to be redeployed or whatever, praying for people's souls, selling pardons or whatever they went on to do, but those jobs disappeared. The difference is the speed and scale at which this is happening again. So this is a phenomenon that has continued, but it's just happening at a different speed. So if you look at some examples, you can see the time from the first mobile phone, uh, so first phone to the first, um, uh, the, the first uh, website, 115 years. And then the time from the first website to the first iPhone, 16. Some other examples. 500 years from the first printing press to the first computer printer, and then 31 years from the first computer printer to the first 3D printer. Happening faster and faster in terms of the pace. The other big difference is the types of innovations at the left-hand side happened over lives. On the right-hand side, they're happening within lives. Do you have to respond within your life for these types of innovations? And we can see the same on pickup. So radio, one of the earlier media innovations, took 38 years to reach 50 million people. Relatively slow in terms of the pace of introduction. We can look at some of the other things, television, 13, and then we can get to things like Twitter, nine months. Again, happening within a life rather than over a life. If you're a politician and you started life where radio mattered, didn't matter, by the time you stopped being a politician, almost certainly radio wouldn't still have mattered that much. Now, if you're a politician and you didn't get Twitter, you have to have got it by the time you stop being uh, your political career. You have to be able to respond. So part of this is now, it's happening within careers in terms of this. And we see a whole bunch of different technologies that are gonna be disrupting the world going forward. They include the mobile phone. We've only seen the start of it. Think about the impact that's having on your retail clients, the fact that someone can walk into a store, look at a product, have it demonstrated, and then scan the barcode and get a whole set of prices from elsewhere. Think about that price transparency. Think about the impact Uber's having on the car business. Think about some of these other technologies, but we've only seen the start of it. Other type of disruptive technologies include things like the self-driving car. Think about how cities are gonna work differently. If we can all get into a car and spend the first hour and a half of our time on the way to work in our private car, being driven by the car, doing our emails, being on calls. Why would we necessarily feel the need to live downtown if you have a self-driving car in terms of that? Think about the, the change that's going to have to the way society works. I'll come back and talk a little bit about that. These technology disruptions are happening at an increasing pace. If anyone tells you that technology disruption has slowed down, completely wrong. The next wave of technology disruptions are going to be bigger than what we've seen in the past. 
The third area is aging. And the aging consequences, again, we're all aware it's happening, but are quite striking in terms of the numbers. This chart shows the fertility rates falling, not just in the developed world. This is now a developing world phenomenon. And we can see the number of people over um, 60. See the number goes up. By 2050, that's going to be 35% of the population in the developed world. And it's going to be almost 20% in the developing world. In some countries, it's even more striking. The red shows the countries where the proportion of people over 65 is going to be above 20%. This is an issue in China as well. Now, the consequence of this as it flows through is quite striking. This shows the workforce around the world. The Chinese labor force is going to fall by 150 million people because of their aging as the impact of the one-child policy comes through. This is now not just China, it's not just Japan, the other one. Look at the German numbers. 15 million fewer workers in Germany. When you work this through and on assumptions on productivity, the UK economy could become larger than the German economy as a result of this demographics coming through. There is also consequences you think about many companies. You know, when I look at particularly the technology companies, the traditional technology companies, a lot of their engineers are over 55. So I was speaking to an audience the other day, and I actually asked everyone who's going to retire in the next 10 years to stand up. This was the, not, not the top management team, this was the management team of a company. And it was quite striking how they found it when they looked around and saw the, tech, the capabilities that were not going to be there in 10 years, how worrying that was for them as a management team in terms of that. We're also going to see the number of workers in the world maxing out. And then we're going to see the impact this has on growth. You remember the chart that I started with, how we had this wonderful period of economic growth. We've had 3.5% average growth over the last 60 years, driven by two motors, the demographic motor and the productivity motor. The challenge is, as the demographics work through, we're going to be in a world where if the productivity doesn't change, we're going to be growing at only 2% a year. Now, to put that in context, 2% is quite high in comparison to what we've seen for the last 2,000 years, but 2% is less than we've seen since the start of the financial crisis. So the financial crisis, and I don't know about the rest of you, but it hasn't felt as if we've been growing that much to, to me anyway. We're going to be entering a period that unless we get the step change in growth in productivity, we're going to be entering a world of much lower growth. And that means that sort of assumptions on investments and returns, et cetera, et cetera, have to be rethought unless we get this step change in productivity. Uh, and you can do this by country. This is not particularly readable, so I'll jump over this. Um, the fourth force is the fact that we connected the world up in a way that we're not very used to. Now, I'll give you one example that I haven't got on charts here, and that's the country of Greece. Now, Greece as a country has been in default on their government debt 50% of the time since independence. So this is historically a country that, you know, has not necessarily been a terribly good credit risk. Now, unless you were a banker lending to Greece, it really didn't matter whether Greece was in default or not because Greece was pretty disconnected from the world economy. We've now connected Greece up to the world economy, such that if Greece goes into a default, and this is not, after all, now a black swan event, something that's happened 50% of the last uh, 150 years cannot really be viewed as a black swan event, that if an event like that occurs, we get a major problem, because we connected Greece up to the low global economy through the euro. It's, it's always a pleasure to be not speaking in continental Europe. As a Brit, I'm not allowed to talk about the euro whenever I go to Europe. I am allowed to speak about the euro when I'm in Scandinavia and when I'm here in terms of some of the problems of the euro. So that is an example about the fact that we connected things up in a way that we weren't particularly used to. Now, there are other examples. This shows how global flows in terms of cross-border flows have connected the world up. You can see the growth rate we, we've seen going forward and how we've recovered since the financial crisis. Um, this shows how trade flows are expanding. 
and the trade flows are now connecting the world in different ways. It's not just Europe to Asia or US to Asia. We're now seeing South-South flows becoming much, much bigger. But as a result of these connectivities, we have events that we're not very used to happening. This chart shows the correlation of energy prices with food prices on the left-hand side, food and other material prices. And on the right-hand side, it shows how those have changed most recently. These things used to be uncorrelated because we connected them up through biofuels, through demand shocks, through energy being a much bigger ingredient that these have now become much, much more correlated. So that a shock happens in one, it's more likely to happen in another. If you're a policymaker, you're used to the left-hand side of this. You're not used to having an energy price shock and a food price shock at the same time. In a right-hand side, you have to assume that if you've got an energy price shock, you're almost certainly going to be having a uh, food price shock at the same time. Again, connected things. And in fact, I think the most Personal example of the fact that we connected things up can be seen by um, this chart that shows the, the global economic growth. Since the Second World War, we have thrown some pretty big shocks at the global economy. You know, savings and loan collapses. Think about the 9-11. Uh, you know, think about the dot-com collapse. Think about the, 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 all the Middle East wars, um, the, the, the um, invasion of Kuwait. We've thrown a whole bunch of shocks to the world economy. The world economy has proved to be pretty resilient over that 60-year period because it was disconnected. When one bit of the world economy got hit, other bits of the world economy carried on. People used to say when Wall Street sees the rest of the world caught a cold, this chart shows actually that's not the case. When the US was hit, actually the rest of the world was you know, a slight stumble. When you know, Wall Street had a cold, maybe the rest of the world sneezed. But we're now seeing the effect as the world's become more connected. A shock that we've just seen, which has been big, but Lehman wasn't that big in comparison to all the other shocks we've seen, has resulted in the first global recession since the Second World War, because we're in a much more connected world. So those are the four big disruptions that we've seen. Let's start talk a little bit about some examples of what this might mean for your business, for your customer's business, etc. Let's start about the new consumer class. This is the good news part of the story. As we take this 65 million additional people in cities, we are creating a huge consumer class worldwide. We talk about consumer class because middle class means different things around the world. This is people who are able to spend, have disposable income of $10 a day per person. At that point, they're buying a motor scooter, they're getting ready to buy a car, they've got a fridge, they've got a television. Etc. So that they're beginning to consume some products. They'll be start consuming a dollar a day. Some it's a higher level, but we, we use the ten dollar a day as a measure of a consuming class. And as you can see, from 1970 to 1990, the consuming class stayed relatively flat. 23 percent of the global economy, about a billion people. The urbanisation that happened in China and then other emerging markets is growing this consumer class. We've already doubled it. We've taken it from a billion to two billion, and we're on track to take it to four billion. Over half of the world population by 2025 will be able to make discretionary consumer expenditure. That's taking it from sort of 23% to over 50%. And this consuming class is going to be a huge engine of growth, and we've already seen the impact of this. The challenge is where they live. We all assume that you know, much of our view of the world is based on where GDP currently come, happens, left-hand side. So we look at where the growth is going to happen. It's going to be disproportionately emerging markets. But it's not the big mega cities that we know about. It's the next year down that's going to be driving growth. The Shanghai's and the Mumbai's are maxed out. Now, to put this in context, one example is the city of Tianjin. A bit hard to see on this chart. Has anyone been to Tianjin here? So we've got two people, three, three people. So a city that's not particularly well known in China. Describe Tianjin. Near Beijing. Yeah, 
So here, here is a city that you know, many of us don't necessarily know. Put it in context, the GDP of Tianjin at the moment is about $130 billion. So this city where three of you have been to, $130 billion. Now, $130 billion is a bit difficult to visualize, but you know, again, put that into context, that's about the same as Stockholm. Now, if we paint this picture going forward, by 2025, the GDP, Stockholm is one of the fastest growing cities in Europe. We'll get to about 200 billion. Tianjin goes a bit faster than that, 600 billion. Um, Stockholm stops being a very good comparator in this. A much better comparison is Sweden. So the GDP of Tianjin is on track to be about the same as Sweden. Now, as you think about your clients, who covers Tianjin in their business versus who covers Sweden? I've asked executives this. Normally, they have no idea who covers Tianjin. And when they look it up, it's about five grades lower, if they have anyone, that is, in comparison to who covers um, Sweden. So, you know, we know it's happening. We know emerging markets are growing. But no one has allocating the real, or very few companies are reallocating resources to the extent they need to to reflect this. Um, one of our ways of helping people get their intuition is we put a lot of this data in an app. You can download it for free. It's called Urban World. Um, you can play around. It has all of these cities, the data in it, and you can play around and do comparison of your home city against other cities uh, around the world and be able to play around with that. Because we found that many executives were struggling to get their head around the data on this. Um, we're also finding that technology is opening new paths to these consumers in a different way. The internet in China is bigger now than the internet in the US. E-commerce in China is bigger than e-commerce in the US. If you're on a third tier city in China, you just can't buy the products there because the stores aren't there, so you buy it online. And the Chinese are innovating. There's a, um, a courier service that will turn up with the clothes and wait five minutes while you try them on. And if they don't fit, you hand them back to the courier and he takes it back. Uh, different ways of doing it. You know, and if you're in a second or third tier city where there's no other options to buy stuff, the internet is providing a different way. The classic retail stores will perhaps never develop in those parts of the world in terms of that. So that's the first example. The second example of how this is changing the world is about resources. And we've already seen the consequence. You remember I started with this chart showing how commodity prices have fallen over 100 years. Despite what we've seen recently, commodity prices are now have doubled since the low point, the year 2000. Because we've gone from a billion to two billion, and we're on track for four billion. So we're going to see lots of pressure on resources going forward. Now, when we go through and we look at different types of products, food is most striking. Striking. We're going to need twice, or sorry, three times as much food on, the me on this measure. We're measuring food on the basis of land output because it's not going to be you know, food that, um, it's not that the absolute amount of food is going to grow, it's going to be much more land intensive. It's going to be food that requires, so it's going to be more meat rather than more, more vegetables. And that just requires a lot more land to, to be able to sort of grow it. So we're going to see a lot of pressure on commodities going forward. The good news is there's a lot of productivity opportunities going forward in how we address that. But resource productivity is going to be a big theme for companies and also for the global economy. The third area was capital. And I started by um, showing how capital had got cheaper. Underpinning that was the fact that global investment has fallen. Investment into products, uh, in, in, into buildings, into infrastructure, into plants and equipment. We've had a, you know, a long period where actually investment has fallen because we've been industrializing less. So we paint this picture going forward, we're going to be in a world where capital investment is going to need to rise. As we go from a billion to four billion, they're going to want to have more housing. They're going to want to have airports. They're going to want to have, they're going to spend more money on hospitals. So we're going to require more capital going forward. At the same time where traditional savers are going to be starting to uh, reduce their savings because they're going to be aging. So we're going to be in a world where the fundamental supply and demand balance on capital could become much tighter. Now, there's a big caveat to that, and that's the biggest borrower in the world are governments, 
and governments have been hugely benefiting from the low interest rates and from quantitative easing programs. 25%, nearly 25% of UK government debt is now owned by the Bank of England. Effectively, that debt is written off. Every time they make an interest payment, it gets dividended back to themselves. So we're going to be sitting in a world going forward where we're going to have this tension. Demand for capital under fundamentals is going to become much tighter. But in terms of actually the central banks, there's going to be a huge concern of can governments afford that world? And can they get away with what they've done over the last five years in terms of creating additional capital? And how that plays out is going to be one of our big challenges. We'll see bubbles as they create too much, and then we'll see it going back, and then we'll see the government under financial pressure as interest rates start going back up again. And that's back and forth is going to be quite an interesting dynamic. And we're going to have come, central bankers are going to become potentially much more political in terms of this world. Let's now talk about a market you're more familiar with, the whole labor market, and what this means. Well, the first area is technology has been destroying jobs already. Now, if you think about a building when you went into a, um, an office 30 years ago, how big the typing pool was, those have all disappeared. 80% of typists have disappeared. So technology has been coming in and destroying jobs you know, recently, and we're seeing some of that happening. But we're seeing that the nature of the jobs being destroyed becoming more and more skilled in terms of some of the technology. You know, called, you know, if you think about the way law firms used to operate, there's a huge amount of associate work going through, or paralegals going through documents in terms of a law case. We're actually seeing that now moving towards expert systems and technology being able to actually replace that. So it's not just the unskilled jobs that are now being replaced. And as we talk about how jobs have been created and destroyed going forward, the jobs that require still the high skills, the interaction jobs are being created, and the, the jobs that are being destroyed are the unskilled ones, the transaction and the ones that are requiring production. Now the consequence of this is the types of skills we need are gonna be very different. If you look at the importance of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and maths degrees, those are going to be increasingly important on jobs going forward. A simple example is think about a nurse. 30 years ago, a nurse used to be able to have to operate two pieces of equipment, a thermometer and a stethoscope. Now there is no such thing as a nurse. They all have to have some type of computer operations effectively. And they're all much trained in much more different skills in terms of their, their ability to operate machinery. Now the challenge we have in the United States is only 15% of graduates have STEM degrees. In comparison to China, 42. And Singapore is over 50. And as we're going into a world where technology is gonna become more and more important, there is a question about are we producing the right type of degrees in terms of this. I was talking to the former Prime Minister of New Zealand. He said the thing he was most proud of having done was increase the number of graduates that came out of New Zealand universities when he was Prime Minister. He said his biggest mistake was he let the academics choose the subjects. Because he said, look, you know, we should have said it was only STEM degrees. We increased the number, it should have been STEM only. Because with great respect to everyone in the room who have liberal arts degrees, he said we don't need any more people with uh, degrees in media studies. So I think that's a sort of challenge as we look going forward. Are we getting the right type of backgrounds? And as you're thinking about your children's education, bias towards STEM. Now, the UK is now doing a push where coding, whatever it means, it's a bit ill-defined, is going to be part of the national curriculum where everyone who goes through high school will have to learn coding. It sort of seems a kind of obvious thing to do in the world we're going into going forward. But it's taken the politicians in a lot of parts of the world quite a long time to do some of that. But maybe the biggest problem we're going to face in the global economy is the imbalance about the different skills and about how people are getting paid. This chart demonstrates it quite uh, acutely for the US. And it shows male high school, as a male, um, hourly work wages. As you can see, graduate schools salaries have been continued to increase. And the unskilled, in this case measured by high school dropouts and high school graduates, has actually been in decline in real terms since 1975. 
Now, this is not some catalyst conspiracy. This is about supply and demand. The jobs we've created have been at the top. The jobs that we've replaced through technology and through immigration have been at the bottom of this, this chart. That's where the you know, immigration, offshoring, trade, and technology replacing jobs have been for the unskilled. Now, the fact we haven't had a big protest is that this has been masked over the last 25 years. It's been masked by two factors. The women participation rate has increased, so the households have got better off, even though the man is earning less. And secondly, we've had a huge asset price boom, because if you remember the chart I showed before, interest rates have been declining. The interest rates have fallen meant that the asset prices, whether that be houses, have increased. People have been better off as a result. So we haven't seen the protests we're getting. The trouble is those two ways of masking it, and in some parts of the world we've also had transfer price, transfers have increased as well. Um, but the trouble is those three sources of being able to mask it are not sustainable going forward. So this group at the bottom it's going to increasingly start saying, we understood the benefits of trade. We understood the benefits of migration. We understood the benefits of offshoring. And we sort of bought it. But we no longer buy it. Because we are no longer growing up rich than our parents. We are growing up poor on that balance. And as this group grows and becomes less satisfied, you know, less satisfied with the system, the whole underpinning of the multi-party view of the world and the Democrats and Republicans on trade and migration have been actually pretty close. You know, the Labour and the Conservative Party in the UK have been very close. You go by country by country. The main political parties have historically all had a pretty good consensus about the system of trade, immigration. That consensus is going to come under pressure increasingly, and we're going to see this group that is starting to say, we no longer buy it. We no longer, therefore, buy Washington or Brussels or London. We will vote for UKIP. We'll vote to support the Tea Party. We'll vote for Mademoiselle Le Pen in France. We're starting to see the rise of these non-traditional parties, where all the thing they really stand for is, we don't stand for the old system that was in place, the migration, the, the, the trade, the globalization system. And that pressure, and I'll come back and talk about that in a few minutes. Fifth area is what does this mean for the way that companies compete? Now, many of us have a model that the world economy is actually dominated by large companies from the developed world. And that actually was the case, as you can see here. This is looking at the Fortune 500 companies. You can see the vast majority of those came from the developed world. Now, we did a projection where we said that by 2025, half of this largest companies in the world are going to come from emerging markets. And there were some people who sort of slightly mocked us in terms of the extreme. And that may not be your intuition, some of it may be. Actually, the reality is we're already halfway there. If you look at 2013, we got to a point where over 25% of the Fortune 500 are actually coming from emerging markets. And we've seen this story before. Think about Japan, think about Korea, South Korea. You know, these companies have become major parts of the, the, the global economy. And I think there's a question for all of you. As you think about your customer base, how well positioned are you when the companies in that red part of the bar versus the black part in terms of that? So the first major shock we're gonna see in the global economy is the rise of these companies from other parts of the world. And these are going to make a different set of behaviors. First of all, they're not going to be as obsessed by quarterly earnings. When I lived in South Korea, actually, you know, the Korean companies, they said their biggest source of advantage over the American companies was not the fact that they had their employees who could work much harder, though they thought that was some sort of an advantage, but they also said, we're not worried about next quarter's earnings. We're worried about building long-term sustainable position. And I think that's part of the the benefit they're going to bring. They're going to bring a degree of brutality to how they compete. Many of these emerging market companies do model themselves on what the South Koreans have done. The South Koreans will quite happily have two competing R&D centers. I was in with a very well-known American firm, and they were saying, well, should we move this R&D to the Asia or keep it in the US? I said, you should do both, have them compete. And they turned to me and said, that's a very Korean answer. 
to the question. Well, you know, that's what the competitors are going to do. They will have a US R&D facility and they'll have a US, uh, an Asian one and they're going to be competing with each other. And the one that does well will get promoted and the one that does well, less well, well in Korea, they would get fired. I'm not sure they'll necessarily be that extreme, but they might be. So this is going to bring a sort of brutality about the way that the world of competition works in terms of this going forward. But there's another sort of shock for many of uh, your large clients or our large clients as well in the Western world. And that's the rise of technology changing the game about how, who wins. So you probably can't see this very well, but this is a screenshot if you go onto Thai Google and search for a two kilowatt electric motor. And it's quite striking on this Thai Google that the paid site at the top is Siemens. So Siemens are paying to be up there. The first site that doesn't pay to be on there is Alibaba. So this is in Thailand if you're trying to buy an electric motor and you search on Google, the first site that comes up is Alibaba and you can click on the Alibaba one and it gives you a choice of 48,000 different electric motors, different you know, voltages, different powers, different insulations and you can click on each of them. But the interesting thing is that many of this, these companies are relatively small manufacturers in China. Now, if you look at the picture, you can do a comparison of the different ones and see where they are. If you were to go back and say 20 years ago what was happening, if you wanted to buy this motor in Thailand, you would buy it from Siemens. Siemens would have the ability to get these contract manufactured, probably not that point in China, but from Indonesia or maybe it was China, from these different players. And these players would be working as contract manufacturers for Siemens. Siemens would run a supply chain and would be able to then bring it to their warehouse and sell it into to people who wanted to buy it in China, in Thailand. Now, the world has changed. These contract manufacturers are now able to compete just as well against Siemens. In fact, maybe even more so. We're seeing technology changing what was historically a source of competitive advantage for the likes of Siemens and destroying that. And the companies, they, there is economy scale still in this world, it's just with Alibaba. These small players are able to compete just as effectively against the large players. Because the technology, the source of competitive advantage of scale has moved to the marketplaces and is no longer a source of competitive advantage to be a large company. We've seen this in other examples. The UK government has introduced something called G Cloud, which allows technology I IT companies to be able to sell to the government. We now see about 50% of the contracts going to SMEs. Those SMEs could not cover all the buyers originally, historically. They weren't able to go around and deal with all the buyers of IT and government. Now with G Cloud, they're able to go in and compete and they're able to compete at a different level. The government's very happy. The cost of IT has fallen by a roughly a factor of two as a result of this. And we're seeing the impact of the fact that these small companies compete. So for your traditional large companies, they're in for a double shock. They're in for the double or treble shock. The treble shock of the economy being a bit slower, interest rates being higher, all of the other things I talked about. They're into the rise of these new competitors from emerging markets that are going to bring a different way of competing, a different behavior. And they're going to also bring, uh, see the rise of these small companies, they're going to be able to compete in a different way. And that's going to be quite a challenging world going forward. Now, of course, it's challenging for them, the people who we really have to pity are the political leaders here. And the political leaders are going to face, first of all, the problem I just talked about, about the rising inequality and the group of people who are going to be unhappy with the system. But they're also going to have to face where, as their populations get older, their financial positions get much tougher. Um, you can see we've already seen the growth in debt since the financial crisis, huge growth in debt for uh, the public. Um, com uh, public uh, debt levels have gone up. And we paint the picture going forward, we see deficits are going to be in a much tougher position going forward as governments um, uh, I have to, sorry, go back to that one. Um, as we look at the debt to GDP ratios of governments, there are levels that can't be necessarily sustained going forward. And we're going to see increasing pressure on their financial uh, positions as their population ages. So people talk about the UK National Health Service needing another 25 billion a year. 
just to keep still with the aging of the population. But that's only part of the challenge. The other big challenge is for politicians is the fact that the electoral system doesn't give credit for the long term. And I think the German story shows that quite strict, uh, quite um, extreme case. Everyone talks about how Angela Merkel is the leader now in Europe, talks about the huge benefits of all of the supply uh, side reforms that happened in Germany 15 years ago and how the rest of Europe needs to do this. The rest of Europe looks at Germany, hears the lecture, and remembers what really happened, which was this guy did them. Chancellor Schroeder. He was the one that made all the supply side changes that Germany's now being congratulated for. And after he made them, he then went to an election and he lost to her. So the problem that most political leaders face is that unlike the stock market, which will give you the credit for the long term, they believe that the political system will not give you the credit for making long-term reforms. So they say, we know what we need to do, we just don't know how to do the right thing and then get elected afterwards. And that's our challenge in our political system, is that we've lost that ability to take long-term thing. So that might be a pessimistic view of the world. And I hope I haven't depressed you too much. Let's talk about what this means for leadership. And I think that the leaders in this world going forward are going to have four main attributes. As we think about the leadership skills in this new storm, uh, in dealing with the storm coming forward, we think there are three main attributes for this. First of all, leaders are going to be absolutely more outward focused, outward facing, and understand how the world is going to change in the second and third order effects. I am still staggered how inside large companies, how inwardly focused many executives are. Now think about some of your clients, think about the industries that have been very profitable, but think about the oil industry, the pharma industry particularly, how inwardly focused many, many executives are in those companies. Think about the you know, people you normally work with, how inwardly focused. I think that the world, as we go into this disruptive world, the winners are going to be disproportionately the people who look at and understand how the world's changing. I mentioned self-driving cars. In 2004, self-driving car had driven in total seven miles. All the self-driving cars in the world. By today, I think that number's out of date, 700,000 miles. 700,000 miles with one accident when someone drove into the back of one of the Google cars. Think about some of the second and third order effects in that world. I talked about the fact that you may live different places. Your early morning commute will be all sitting in the cars doing that. Why would you own a car if it could just turn up? You know, you've already seen the effect of this, but this is Uber without, you know, the cost, you don't even need to have a driver. All the cars will have the technology. We'd all be sharing cars. Think about how unused all our cars are. They operate at two, three percent or whatever utilization. If we're in a shared thing where we just push a button on our mobile phone and a taxi pod arrives. But think, think about some of the other effects. And this is where those of you who may have to have a heart transplant need to wake up. This car has driven, these Google cars have driven 700,000 miles without an accident. As we move towards more and more self-driving cars, the number of car accidents is going to reduce radically. First order effect, self-driving cars. Second order, large part of the thing. Third order effect, many fewer accidents. Fourth order, supply of hearts for transplants. Until we can 3D print them is going to be a problem. So for those of you whose intuition is you'll put that heart transplant off for 10 years, that may not be the right intuition in terms of how you think about this stuff. Now, it's a good news story too. A million fewer people dying a year in road accidents. A very, very positive story has some second and third order effects. The executives in this world are going to be disproportionately outward facing. They're going to understand how the world's going to respond changing, understand the opportunities that creating, the destruction that's happening in the business, and going to be ready to respond to it. So that's the first attribute, outward focused. The second one is going to be about agility and speed of operation. This picture shows some Indians celebrating. This was the Indian 
space team celebrating the fact that they just put an orbiter into space around Mars. They were the fourth space agency to have done that. The first one to have managed to succeed the first time to do it. But what is more staggering, it's not the speed at which they did it, but the cost. They did this for $75 million. The Indians put an orbiter around Mars for $75 million. To put that into context, the film Gravity cost $80 million to make. <laughs> so you can have George Clooney doing Gravity, or you can have the real thing for $5 million less. The last time NASA bought a, well, yeah, okay. The last time NASA bought a, uh, an orbiter um, from, I think it was Lockheed Martin, it cost $750 million. The Indians did it for a tenth. And that's, I think, speed and agility. Now, how did the Indians do it? Well, they didn't invent everything themselves. They took the best ideas from around the world, they pulled it together, they borrowed ideas, they assembled it. They wouldn't have been able to do it if it hadn't been for the fact that NASA had already done one. And they were able to bring those ideas together. But they were able to respond in an agile way. And we think as the world is gonna be more turbulent, the best leaders are gonna be the agile ones, the ones who are able to be outward focused and when they understand how the world's changing, be able to be agile. They're gonna be the best companies in the world are gonna be the ones that are gonna be agile and be able to be responding. And the third actually, well, you know, during my talk, some of you are going to be having sat there and thought, this is a pretty depressing world. He's talked about politicians not having the right leadership capabilities, talked about the fact that the world's going to be growing up with a chunk of people poor on their parents. He's talking about the rise of new competitors. He's talking about all my traditional clients going to have a source of disadvantage that's going to be disappearing. There'll be more pressure on my fees, et cetera, et cetera. And my children have liberal art degrees and they're not going to, what are they going to be able to do in jobs? So some of you may be sitting there feeling a little depressed about the world I've just described. You may also be actually saying, well, you know, technology is getting more and more sophisticated. At some point, we're going to find that technology is going to be doing my job better than me. And at some point, technology might start taking control. And we're going to see the Skynet taking control and being able to go out and try and eradicate human beings, the artificial intelligence threat we're all facing. Now, that's a view of the world. There's an alternative view of the world, which is that we're actually going to be able to have tailored medicines that take out cancer, that will be designed around our genome, that will come in and be able to treat cancer as us as individuals. We're going to have a global population where over half of the world's population will be able to consume. We have enough resource productivity. We have huge growing market. So we go from a billion to four billion consuming class people. And we have technology releasing more opportunities. And it's not in the GDP numbers, but think about the value of being able to search for everything for your PC. Huge value in terms of going forward. I think the winners are going to be the ones who take an optimistic view. Because you can take a view of this world and you can say this is a world where we've got to fight these changes, we've got to stop them happening, we've got to cling on to what we've got left. Or we can say, look, this is a world that's actually on track to deliver the Millennium Goals through urbanization. We've already taken more people out of poverty through the urbanization. We've taken close to a billion people out of poverty. Put that in context. There are more people now alive as a result of urbanization. We're saving 20 million lives a year. That's more than the eradication of smallpox as a result of this urbanization. So we have a positive view of the world. And I think the, the winners are going to be the people who are actually able to understand the opportunities to say that, yes, there's a pessimistic view of the world, but there's an optimistic view too. So those are, I think, the leadership attributes. And as you think about your businesses and the executives you're searching for, now, I think there's increasingly going to be a premium of, are these people externally focused? Can they understand how the world's going to change? Are they going to be agile enough to be able to respond? And finally, are they going to be the optimists? Are they going to be the people that see the opportunities that come? Or are they going to be the pessimists that are going to be trying to hang on to the past? Thank you.